Please don't fly it to us. It is no better. No, yeah. Yeah. Your voice is very low. Okay, so I think it's a pro uh, the problem with the cable or something. So if it's better, I'll keep it. Okay, so please, as much as possible, let us try to Please, sisters, let's kindly mute our mics and listen to the lecturer, please. We'll be done very soon. Please, you mute all of us, and that will help because you talk in the knowledge. So please, just mute all of us. So maybe my co host can help me with that. A minute. Okay, I think it's been done. All right. So she tells me you treated preconception care last week. And so I know you are done with. So I'll continue with um diagnosis of pregnancy. Um so what at all is pregnancy and at what moment can one say she's pregnant? Maybe we can start by sharing. How can we know? I know most of us um have children already. And so at which point in time did you get to know? that you were pregnant. Did you see any sign? Yes, good. So Georgina, please go ahead. Hello? 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 Okay, so Georgina is off. Um, Bridget, Bridget, your hand is up. Um, please, when they see, when they miss their periods, when they realize that they've missed their periods. Their periods, very true. Um, I have Esther. <laughs> Hello. Yes, Esther, go ahead. Hello, sister. Yes, go ahead, Esther. Yes, then the next one is, after <laughs> missing your period, mm -hmm. after missing your period, you test with it. Urine test kit to find out if truly you are pregnant. Okay, so kindly on me for me. Okay, so mercy. Go ahead. Morning second. Like morning. Okay. Okay. Um, who do I have again? Bridget. Hey, I can see a hand up. I, sorry, I can't mention your name. Banzo. Let me start by saying Banzo. Mweni Banzo. I don't know. Guys, Mweni Banzo. Mweni Banzo. Banzo. Okay, yeah. I didn't see the Zora. Uh, that is ultrasound scan and it confirms pregnancy. Okay. All right. Okay, so um, I think we can go on and on and on and on. All that we are saying is true. It gives me the idea that we all know a bit about it, if not from practice, from our own experience. Yes. So for most women, um, they know their body so much that the moment their bodies begin to, you know, um, shift out of the normal, they begin to um, suspect something. <laughs> Is not pregnancy. They begin to suspect that okay, Okay, I think we are okay. Wow. Oh, 
All right. So, for most, as I was saying, for most women, they know their body so much that the moment they, be, they begin to, um, you know, go out of the normal, they begin to start that something is wrong somewhere. <laughs> I'm trying to get the code, but maybe she's she's not I don't know who the person is, but um let me try and get there. Um, Please mute your audio. Okay. okay, so I think I got I got it. Um let me start sharing my screen again. Yes. All right. So um knowing our bodies at this point also, I would say that it's very important for us for us here in Africa, not just in Ghana. I mean, we just wake up, go about our daily activities. And we don't really put much concentration or attention on our own bodies, especially we in the health sector. We find ourselves talking to our clients, Madam DBA, Madam do this, do this, this one will help you. But most of us, or majority of us, and um, we go the blind way at our own selves, taking care of our own selves. And at the end of the day, we tend to suffer um, a lot of these health issues. And so knowing our bodies is very, very important. And in pregnancy, it applies. And the research also shows that women who get to know um, their pregnancy very early and therefore access early antenatal care have a higher rate of um, improved health outcomes for themselves and for the babies. And so in a um, daily you know, education to our pregnant women. Let us let us chip in this also that they should know their bodies as women. All right. Okay, so there are some three main ways for which pregnancy can be diagnosed. Somebody mentioned that your menses would stop. Yes, that is true. Um, in some cases, you can see that the abdomen is getting bigger. For some people, they may not even know that they are pregnant. For those who do not pay attention to their bodies, they may not know the changes that may occur in their bodies until they see that their abdomen is becoming bigger. And for others, who, they would have to test, as somebody said, and test for pregnancy with the test. Glad you I don't understand I everybody. Okay. 
So the signs that we may see may be classified into presumptive signs or possible signs. We also have probable sign and then positive signs as well. So going forward, we'll get to know what presumptive signs are, what probable signs are, and what positive signs also are. So pro presumptive signs, we are talking about the physiological changes that the woman herself experiences. So these are the physical signs, as I talked about the fact that they should know their bodies. For people who know their bodies, they will be able to observe that these and these signs uh, what's a, what is a occurring? Yeah. Yeah. So the first of all is that um, we may have cessation of menses. And with a presumptive sign, let me also add that these are not the surest signs that a woman can be pregnant. All the signs we'll be talking about, we may have them in certain medical conditions. And so if, let's say, amenorrhea, you're experiencing amenorrhea, it doesn't, that alone does not mean that some, a woman could be pregnant. So that's what the presumptive sign, signs are. Presume, it comes from the English word presume, that is possible. Okay, so presume these signs could be possible that a woman could be pregnant. So they are not the surest signs or the symptoms that shows that a woman could be pregnant. I don't know if I, the explanation is clear at this point. Kindly let me know if we are okay. Presumptive signs and symptoms. They are the possible signs or presume. Somebody said, I presume or I perceive that it could be. And so it means that it is not um, the, the surest thing that you could be pregnant. I guess we are okay at this point. Yes, madam. Sure. All right. So a woman can be experiencing amenorrhea. So if it's pregnancy, it's, it's been more than 10 days. You've not seen your menses. You expect to see that your, preg uh, your menses will, you know, okay at this time. And after 10 days, it's not coming. Hold on. It's not pregnancy yet. You would have the opp uh, opportunity to you know, look at the other probable or the positive signs for you to confirm that pregnancy really does exist. So what happens for pregnancy amenorrhea to occur is that when implantation of the ovum, you know, occurs, the, the availability of progesterone and estrogen makes it impossible for the endometrium to be shed. You know, this whole thing about menses is that um, during your ovulation period and all those periods, the uterus is being prepared to house a fetus. And so in pregnancy, when the moment of fertilization takes place, implantation occurs, progesterone and estrogen disables the follicles, such that they are not able to, you know, mature to even start the cycle all over again. Also, the house that we need for the fetus has already been formed and the baby is there already. And so it does not need to be shed. That's how come pregnancy amenorrhea occurs. Yes. So other, um, you know, conditions that can cause amenorrhea could be the fact that um, there's an infection somewhere, you are suffering from syphilis, it could be anemia, it could be ovarian and pituitary imbalance, you may have ovarian cysts or multiple fibers because these things they you know they affect our, our cycle or the menstrual cycle such so that you are able to even have your menses. I once attended to somebody, um, she was around 22, 23 years, yes, and she had not had her menses for about four months. She had come in and out of the hospital, and then on one occasion we got to know that it was. Uh, multiple fibroids. Oh, no, she didn't come early. She had stayed for th four months or so that she had not had her menses and so she thought she was pregnant. Only for her to come and we told her that it was um, multiple fibroids that were present in her uterus. Yes. And if somebody is suffering from anemia, the one thing that affects uh, your menstrual cycle a lot is your nutrition. It only it doesn't only affect the number of days your menses will flow. It also even affects your the amount of flow. 
it occurs. There are some, I once attended to somebody again who told me that when she, um, the moment she entered university or SHS, she didn't have her menses that, that whole semester. She came to the hospital and everything was fine. So we canceled her that it could be as a result of a change of environment or nutrition or something like that. So the point I'm trying to say is that um, anemia or malnutrition can cause amenorrhea. We also have um, the fact that there could be localized due to an infection. Yes, change of environment, I mentioned it. And sometimes emotional instability. That one, I believe that most of us, or if not all of us, can, um, since we are all women, we can all attest to the fact that emotional instability can affect our menstrual fluid and sometimes cause amenorrhea in one month or two. So these are um, other conditions, other conditions that can cause amenorrhea and not necessarily pregnancy, okay, as part of the presumptive signs. Okay. We also have morning sickness, where the woman feels nauseous, feels feverish. I say, oh, yeah, uh, please, by the way, do you, most of, I believe most of us understand trees, so that I can be mixing them, because most of our clients are trees in a case where we have to do role play or something. Yes. I believe so, right? Just one person to answer me. Please. No, no, please. no, no, no. no, no. Hello. Hello. English. Okay. No, All please. Right. Okay, I get it. I get it now. All right. So, morning sickness is one of the... I can blink. Okay. <laughs> The woman presents with feeling nauseous, feverish, general malaise, fatigue, weakness. You may present and tell you that when I wake up in the morning, I don't feel all right. It looks like, it looks like I'm sick. Yes, it's one of the presumptive signs. It can be a sign of pregnancy. However, there are other um, conditions that may cause a woman to experience you know, morning sickness. And such is... Um, Dehydration, hypoglycemia, anxiety, if there's any thyroid disease, if there's any gallbladder disease. And if it's pregnancy, you know, the, the presence of the HCU, that's the human chorionic gonadotrophin, it tends to irritate the lining of the gastrointestinal system or tract. And that causes the morning sickness. Yeah, so we are dealing with two sides here. The fact that if it's pregnancy, um, this is what will cause it. And the fact that it could also not be pregnancy causing it. Right. One may also experience bladder irritability. That I believe that we are all conversant with our anatomy such that we know that our, the, the bladder is situated right in front of the uterus. And so now that if it's pregnancy, we have a growing fetus in there. It means we have a content in the uterus, which is going to expand it. And since the bladder, who is this? Okay. And since the bladder is situated right in front of it. Once it, it starts expanding, the least uh, bladder content, you know, you feel like urinating or using the washroom. And that's if it's pregnancy. And if it's not, other condition that can cause it is also pyelonephritis, that's kidney infection or infection of the kidney. And so, yes, morning sickness is a presumptive sign. Bladder irritability is also a presumptive sign. Once again, let me say that we have Grace. Please, is your hands up? Yes, you can go. Sir. Yes. Please, your voice is very low. It's still low. I thought it was better. It's wow. Low. Please, is it okay? Please, is my voice okay? Yes, please. Yes, yes, yes. yes sister. All right. 
Thank you very much. Okay. So for other women, we may have skin changes as well. What we popularly known as cloasma mask or pregnancy mask, um, where there appears dark, you know, pigmentations, especially on the face. Yes, and for people who you know, um, are old women, those are one of the things that they used to presume that somebody could be pregnant. That's why we say that they have eyes. Uh -huh. They have eyes to, you know, um, detect that somebody is pregnant. Plasma mask or pregnancy mask is one of them. You could see that there's, um, I was trying to get a black person where we can really see it well, but it looks like on the internet, we have most of these whites and the other black one, you can't really see it well. But I believe that we've all come into contact with one of these women at some point in time where we've noticed these, this um, kind of plasma mask on their face. And so it's one of the presumptive signs of pregnancy. However, once again, um, other conditions may cause it. Um, such that use of contraceptives, we have certain hormonal therapy, we have um, sorry, some cosmetics also, and sometimes extreme exposure to sunlight can all cause what we call cloasma mask. It may not necessarily be as a result of pregnancy, but it can be as a result of these um, other conditions that we have mentioned. We also have quickening. Somebody will say, as for quickening, if it's if it's if it's if it's if it's, if it's quickening, I can know that I am pregnant. I am pregnant, you know. But it may not Ooh, entirely be Yeah, yeah. It's 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 also a presumptive sign. It's not hundred percent, you know. Mm -hmm you could be pregnant. So this is where you have flattering movements of the fetus um, in there. It's usually occurs from 16 weeks. And for women who have experienced pregnancy before, um, who have not, sorry, experienced pregnancy before, they may start feeling it around 20 weeks. I've had people, women come, hey, madam, so when will I start feeling my baby's movement? It's their first time of being pregnant and they are anxious about the fact that they've not started you know, feeling their baby's movement. And so I assure them, oh, by the following month or by next week or by this week, you start feeling the movement. And sometimes they may they may not even know that it's quickening that has started, but it starts like a fluttering um, movement like that. I, I, I like to call it gas. You know, sometimes when you are bloated and you have gas, you know, down there, that's exactly how it starts in, in first time months. Yes, so... Other conditions, once again, can also cause quickening. You may you may think it's um, your baby moving, but it may not be. We have we have what we call phantom kicks, um, or pseudo kicks, false kicks. You feel it, but they are not really kicks. It may be as a result of intestinal issues. Yes, um, any allergic reaction, probably you're eating something and you feel some rumbling things in your tummy. Yes, and so quickening is also a presumptive sign, not a hundred percent um you know sign that a woman could be pregnant. Yes, so I came across this and I believe that it can help us to um memorize or be able to um for the purpose of examination or not just examination to be able to, for us to easily identify what presumptive signs are. So they used the word presume to form uh, what you call mnemonics, yes. And so the P standing for an absence period, and then R standing for really tired, and then E standing for enlarged breast. Yes, for some people, one of the presumptive signs is that they could have, you know, enlarged breast or their breast will begin to change. Then they begin to experience some tingling sensations in their breast. Some people may also experience sore breasts. Yes. And the U standing for urination increase. That's the um, bladder irritability or the frequency of maturation we spoke about. 
And then the M stand for movement of fetus. And the yeah, that system, you have to fill like a number of courses. I think two or three before you three or four. Before. Okay. All right. So the M standing for the movement of fetus in the uterus. That's the quickening we spoke about. And then the E standing for immersus and nausea. Immersus simply means um, vomiting. That's why how we have hyper hyperemesis, hyper immersus. That's increased vomiting. You know. Uh, so this is just something to help you identify the presumptive sign. Please, any question at this point, you can just raise up your hand and I'll call you out. I guess we are okay. Yes, please. All right, move on. Yes, so that's it with the presumptive signs. We move on to probable signs. These are the investigations we as healthcare providers or midwives, we do to um, detect that this may likely be pregnancy. Okay. The investigations the midwife, you know, performs and comes to the conclusion that, okay, this may likely confirm pregnancy. Once again, it may not be the fact that you are really, really pregnant, but they are probable that you may be pregnant. Yeah, so the first thing is that we may have the human chorionic gonadotrophin hormone in your urine. It's an, um, a hormone that is released into the urine once implantation. In <laughs> And I think this is the one of the commonest, you know, investigations that this is not just about the midwife, but now it's very common out there. The woman's one misses her, you know, period for some time. So just go to the pharmacy shop to get a pregnancy test strip to test whether he or she is pregnant. Yes. So um human chorionic gonadotrophin may be a probable sign. A differential diagnosis is hydatidiform or or choriocarcinoma. When you have that, they also emit HCG in your urine. And remember, we we'll treat, I don't know if we are the same group, I'll be teaching abnormal pregnancy. In when there is hydatidiform mole, they you know also present itself just like pregnancy. Yes. And for them, they 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 are even worse. They that's where you have hyper immersus. Every other positive sign are probable sign are in the, you know, excesses. Yes, and so you may think that you are pregnant and so you take a scan and the scan reveals that there's no really um, a viable fetus in there. Yes. We may also experience what we call um, Hager's sign. That's where we have the esmos being softened. Mm, these days, by reason of, you know, should I say technology or mass knowledge, you don't really have a midwife, unless maybe in the peripheries, um, in the district area. I may not, I may not be right with that, but um, you may not have the midwife really, you know, performing these investigations themselves. Another factor could be that maybe the women themselves don't even present to the clinic early. I mean, you can ask yourself how many. And um, pregnant women even get to know they are six weeks pregnant. Few of them. They these days they come, they are 20 weeks, they are 18 weeks gone already. Yes. So the Hager sign can be seen between six to 12 weeks of pregnancy. Here you insert two fingers into the anterior phonics of the vagina, and the other hand is also placed abdom abdominally. So this way, I wish it was a physical class. So um, one hand under the vagina, 
inside the vagina and then the other hand ab plays abdominally and um you try you know putting the two together and you notice that they can almost meet because the isthmus the lower part of the uterus has become very soft and that is also one sign yes and it's called Heget sign kindly pay attention to the various terms yes because you may not um meet something like softening isthmus or softening cells that you may see he gets signs so please take um particular attention to that not just for exam purposes i always say that <clears throat> that the things that we learn shouldn't be for just examination purposes but our own selves we as midwives imagine that we are able to utilize the terms that we um, you know learn in school I mean, you look, I'm saying that in, in comparison to the doctors. And they come to yeah. the world during world rounds. Hello? Yeah. Please, can I move on? Okay. Yes, so I'm beseeching us all that we need to utilize these terms in our day-to-day -day activities. I mean, not just uh, relegate it to the doctors. They come to the ward and they are mentioning these terms. And I mean, we are all mesmerized. We, we may not even, sometimes we don't even know what they are talking about and make them look like they are some superhumans. But I'm telling you, all these things are in our books. But because when we get to the ward, we are used to our normal, you know, what we use, that's how we do it. You know, we don't um, express ourselves in these terms. And even amongst ourselves as, co as colleagues, it has gotten to the point where if they start using these terms, they'll begin to, hey, now, why? What is, what is happening to you? Hey, why? Why? Now, now, what is happening to you? You know, that kind of um, funny statements they'll begin to make. But we can all start from somewhere if we want to change the face of this, our profession. Yeah, so that was just by the way. And the next thing is Jack Mier sign or Chadwick sign. These terms, they are all people's names. They were named after them because they, you know, propounded them or they um, came about with this sign. And they sound um, big names, but they are people's names, certain people's names. So Jack Mier sign or Chadwick sign, um, this is as a result of the uh, high vascularity you know, once pregnancy takes place, all the vessels, all the, you know, veins, they all, you know, rush there to the uterus to support the growing fetus. And we have this violet blue discoloration of the vaginal mucous membrane. Yes. And that is what we term the Japanese sign or the Chadwick, <clears throat> sorry, the Chadwick sign. We also have the internal ballotment where the woman is placed in a semi-recumbent position, two fingers are inserted, inserted into her vagina, and the uterus is given a very sharp tap, pat like that. And then if there's pregnancy, of course, If it's pregnancy, it will cause the fetus to, you know, float in the amniotic fluid. Um, in that in that order, so you feel a a bouncing, you know, um, technology over there in the uterus, and that's what we term the internal development. Once again, these things they sound um theoretical. You may not practically you know, do some of these things. I mean, because they themselves do not come early. Yes, Bridget, please go ahead. Um, please, it's not like I'm taking us backwards, but with the presumptive signs in the Margaret Mouse, mm -hmm. um, the skin changes was under probable signs, not presumptive. So I want to know if there have been some changes or not. Which, which edition? Thank you. Which edition are you referring to? Mm, 15. Because I also used Margaret Mouse. Let me see. Mine is... 
MNX Pages. Okay, so please come again with your question. Bridget. Um, my question is, mm -hmm. in your notes, mm -hmm. yeah, like the slides, mm -hmm. skin changes was under the presumptive signs, mm -hmm. but in Margaret Mouse, hey, sorry, uh, but in Margaret Mouse, it's under probable signs. So I want to know if there have been some changes. Okay, I think I get you now. Um, probably must be. Let me see. Let me go to my word document. okay so i'll i think i would rectify that i've seen where the problem came from you still can't hear me please can you hear me now yes please yes we can hear you okay, so what i'm saying that i'll rectify that later on i've seen where the problem is from So I'll get it rectified before I let you have the the, the slides. Okay, thank you. Thank you, too. thank you very much. Okay, so we also have what we call the uterine suffo. Okay, so this is where um, as a result of the increased blood flow to the uterus, you have um, you know these um, 
murmuring sounds that are heard on auscultation. And sometimes it's synchronous with the maternal pulse. And it may also be present when there are fibroids. And so we need to be careful with that. It occurs usually um, between 12 and then 16 weeks. That's with the uterine suckle. We also have Braxton Hicks contractions, where, which is I know is very common. We, that's one we can all relate very commonly. Um, where there are painless contractions, which do not necessarily result in cervical dilatation. So a woman comes to the clinic, madam, it looks like my I'm having contractions. And this is somebody who is about, um, let's say, 32 weeks. Yes. So you don't do away with her and tell her that, oh, no, it's breast and hips. Okay? So you go away to go. No. A woman experiencing this kind of contractions may also be as a result of UTI. Yes. UTI can cause contractions and preterm delivery. So any infection of that sort can cause the woman to experience that. And so when they come, just do the investigations, rule them out and let them go so that you know you have done your part. She would also have the clear mind that um, this is what is causing that. And so I'm very okay. Yes. We also have the OCND sign where pulsations are heard on the lateral vaginal phonics. And also due to, you know, increased blood supply from the enlarged uterine artery. So when you insert your two fingers into the vagina, the lateral side, you can feel pulsations because blood flow is, you know, rushing into the uterus. We also have the softening of the cervix. That's the Goodell sign. It also happens... Also, on the Marco baby. Huh? Oh, working my plan. I'm almost having a good one. What's in the party where you for what? No, 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 Yes, I've muted all of them. Okay, so I also came across. Yes, Debbie. Deborah. Madam. Yes, go ahead. Please, um, with the breast and hips contractions in pregnancy. Mm -hmm. When is a woman supposed to get contraction during the early pregnancy? Because I learned from six weeks to 12 weeks, a woman can go through contractions. Yes, so between six weeks and 12 weeks, they may present with lower abdominal pain, but it may not yeah. necessarily be breast and his contractions. You know, for the masses, they, they have their own, let me say, funny way of describing what's happening to them. But it is up to us to be able to diagnose it properly, you know. So if a woman presents at 12 to 14 weeks, um, 6 to 12 weeks with um, lower abdominal pains, okay, so she is saying that it's breast and hicks. But to you, um, you should carry out your investigations. Do your full blood counts. Do your urine examinations. Rule out UTI. Rule out probably malaria, if they, are, they all turned out to be negative, counsel her on the fact that um, it's early pregnancy and she may feel some of these things. Counsel her on rest and sleep. And I think you with that is a very good you know management. I don't know if you understand me. Yes, please, I get it. Yes. Thank right. you. You're welcome. Yes, Hannah, please go ahead. Hannah, your hand is up. Madam Rosemo. Yes. Please ask. I'm suggesting after teaching, then maybe you take 30 minutes to ask questions. Otherwise, we won't. Like, 
It's a suggestion. Okay. Yes. Thank so you. well, well taken. Thank you very much. Okay. So just as we did with the presumptive sign, this is just a mnemonic for you to um be able to memorize or get to easily, you know, make out your probable signs where we have the positive pregnancy test, the internal bad luck may we talk about that, the turning of the fetus, outline of the fetus, that is you can, you know, palpate it abdominally. We have Preston Hicks, we have the softening of the cervix, we have the bluish discoloration, and we have the Higgins sign as well. So when you have the slides, you can just go through them. It's just a mnemonic to help you with the probable signs. So we move on to the positive signs. Oh. I think it was not. Yes, so these are the positive signs. These signs are more definite and they are very conclusive. In this case, we know that for sure a woman could be pregnant. We have the evidence from your, from an ultrasound scan, the fact that you can hear fetal hearts and then you can also see fetal movement. When you combine all these, you, we have positive signs, you know, of pregnancy. And with this, they 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 have to do the more with the fetus. And so just as we did with the presumed probable, this time we are not doing positive, rather we are doing fetus. We form the mnemonic with the Word fetus so that you can easily make out um, um, the positive signs. Okay, yes. Let me just skip it and be fast because it looks like you just have to close that one. So we move on to look at signs of previous pregnancy. Um, a woman may come to you, you have a primary gravida and then a multi gravida. On physical examination, the, the what you see on a primary gravida may be different from what you will see on a multi gravida. And a midwife, as a midwife, you should be aware of the fact that the woman has previously given birth or not. It would all inform your decisions. It will also inform your management and your care. So the breasts, you know, are more flabby and the nipple more prominent in women who have breastfed. That's those. In, if anybody has ever given birth, you could, you could notice that the breast becomes more flabby, and the nipples, you know, become more prominent. And then sometimes the pigmentation of the areola may still be persist, may may still be present. You may still see them there. And other times the abdominal muscles in one who has ever delivered become more laxed. So if we take a primary gravida, and we take a multi gravida the abdominal muscles of a primary gravida is very tough than one who has who is a multi gravida you know for them when you're doing palpation is very you know they have a very light skin the muscles are very lax and all that we may also have stri gravidarium in the in the multi gravida stri gravidarium that's talking about stretch marks we still we may still have it on the the one who has ever given birth as a result of a previous pregnancy the uterine wall um, of one who has ever delivered is less rigid and the fetus is very easy to palpate, as I spoke about when I was talking about the abdominal muscles. And in the vagina, it may be a bit more gaped and more patulous for one who has ever delivered. And that is where people talk about um, the fact that they want to tighten up and all that. Well, I, I, I didn't want to use the word gape but that is how I needed to do it because the fact that you are seeing gap, we may feel uncomfortable. Hey, then I need to tighten it, you know. Uh -huh. But you know that's how it has to be. The vaginal orifice also becomes larger, and then the folds mostly flattens out. Just this week, a friend of mine, she's in UK now. She called me that if I was less busy, we should talk, and I we spoke. Then the fact that she's seen some growth something on her vagina, in, in on her vulva, it looks like it's a standing to my vagina. I was like, ah, 
the way I yeah, the way I explain, I can't get it. You take a shot of it and send to me. She sent me the shot and I I was I was just laughing. So she had she had a child not long ago. And these things we are talking about concerning the vagina and the vulva, these are what I was seeing on her vulva. And she couldn't, you know, take it the fact that she knew her body. She knew how the vagina was. She knew how the vulva was. And we just, after giving birth, this is how it, it looks like. The folds are, fl are flattened. You look at the orifice. You can see the, um, what do you call it, the folds coming out and all that. I loved that and I told her that these are all normal. She shouldn't worry. And so, yes, I'm coming to the fact that if a woman has delivered before during labor, you would see some of these signs. You may see some of these signs, you know, exhibiting. The labia major minora tend to project below the majora and becomes quite darker and leathery in texture as well. And then with the peri per perineum, it tends to be laxed and sometimes the scars from previous episodes may also be seen. Let's talk about pseudo sizes. Pseudo, false, sizes, pregnancy, false pregnancy. We have women who are battling with um, you know, infertility or those who want to, not that they are battling, but they want to have children on their own. They may come to their clinic showing some of these signs and symptoms because of the fact that their minds, you know, are, their minds are tuned to the fact that they think they may be pregnant. Once I was at the clinic, I we were calling out names and we called out one name. This woman came to the room for palpations to be done. So she laid on the bed and I had a group of um, junior colleagues doing the palpation. So they called me to come. And when I entered, when I got to her, I palpated the abdomen and I looked, looked at her book and her gestation. It didn't really tell me. Then I called out her name again. This woman responded. And I was like, um, Dabena, when did you come? When was the last time you came? You came to the clinic and she said a month ago. I said, okay. Then I went to the sonographer and I went to see Then I said, I'm, this woman is coming. I'm sending this woman over to you. Can you look at everything for me? So when the woman came to lie down at the sonographer's office, he called me and he told me this woman is not pregnant. And I said, ah, what are you talking about? We've called her name. She, 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 she responded. I, I called her name one more time. And she said that's her name. So she's not pregnant. And I think she was about 32 weeks gone or so. And on the, the SFH we were getting was like, was ne nowhere near 12 because she was a bit bulky. And so the abdomen was to measure to be about 10, even though it was not accurate. So upon further, I sat the woman down upon further interrogation. Then she opened up and she was, she told me that uh, the last time she came to see the doctor and the doctor said uh, she may get pregnant this week. And I was like, okay. So in that case, she's been experiencing certain signs and she feels she's pregnant. For some reason, we mentioned somebody's name, even though that's not her. Later I got to know that was not her name. She got up, came to bed, came to even lie down. Because if you are not pregnant and you ask you to lay on the bed, why would you even lay, lay down on the bed, you know, in the first place? And so pseudocytes really, um, you know, exist. And so per counseling, you may get to you know some of these women and manage them appropriately. Yeah, so at this point, I'll take my questions and then we'll move on. These ones they are very simple. They, they are things that I know most of us are serving officials and so we know some of these things. They are very simple. Just for um, the sake of theory, you need to go through them once again. Yeah. They are not very difficult at all.
Mm-hmm. Hello, Madam. Yeah. yeah. Madam, please, what about a uh, cryptic pregnancy? Please come again. I'm talking about um, what of a cryptic pregnancy? What pregnancy, please? That one, um, the person is actually pregnant, but is not aware that she she uh, she is pregnant, and they can carry it to term. Most of the time, in the delivery room, that they will get to know that they are pregnant. Oh yes, it's called cryptic pregnancy. Yes. Yes, that's very true. That one also really, really, really exists. Um, but it's very common among the teenagers. I've seen more than two teenagers present with that case. One, the recent one was one who was staying with a certain woman. I mean, she had stayed with the woman for the time, all this time, so I presume it to be 40 weeks or nine months. She was just there once complaining, started complaining of low abdominal pain. They rushed there to the hospital and I'm telling you, the lady was made to give birth. Let me say it that way. And everybody, the woman was shocked. She was she just, she was just, she couldn't even talk. The fact that somebody has been pregnant in her house for nine months and she didn't see, and the girl herself, she didn't open up whether um, deliberately or not. She didn't know. I'm sure if, if she knew, she would have aborted or maybe left the house or something like that. So, yes. So, madam. Very My true. issue is that most of them they they bleed though. They'll bleed throughout. Like they'll get their menses at the regular interval. Sometimes it um it lights, but they still have their pregnancy. That's why some of them don't get to know that they are pregnant till time. And I don't know how it happens that way. So I'm happy you are saying that the bleeding, the mesh menses is light. It's light. So that if you know your body so well, and let's say you, you've experienced um, light bleeding for, for two months or two of your cycles, I mean, you should query about it, go to the hospital, get it checked. I don't know if you understand me. Because at the yeah, I, it, I do understand. At, but the fact that they get it uh, in monthly uh, interval, they they might not even think that they are pregnant. And no. per what I've read, it is said that you are not supposed to bleed in pregnancy, even if it is as little as whatever, yes. you, you are not supposed to bleed. Uh-huh. Yes. So I don't understand so, why they are able to bleed and still be pregnant or them and don't so, know that they are pregnant. The, those, for those people, if you take the history very well, you will get to know that they were not bleeding every month. Please, you understand me. I don't know if you've ever attended yes, such, such, such a person. If you take the history very well, they will tell you at a certain point it stopped. So the times that they were seeing the, the bleeding, will do bleeding in pregnancy. It could be um, threatened abortion that got resolved because they didn't know they didn't know. It could be yeah, implantational. Exactly, that day they told they didn't know. Uh huh. So they will tell you that they didn't get the bleeding every month of the nine months. No. At a certain point, they will tell you that it stopped and then it came back, or something like that. Because they didn't know, some of these investigations couldn't be done. Uh-huh. If they knew, we had done the If they knew and we had done the investigations, would have picked out um, the issues to resolve them. I understand your question, but when such people come to you, take your history very well. Don't let them go with the conclusion that they, they were pregnant and they were still having their menstruation. At a certain point in time, the, the bleeding stopped. And it was you yourself, you mentioned that the bleeding, the amount was light. Good afternoon, sister. Please, are you okay? I want to ask a question. Are you okay? Yes, Nafisa, please, you can go ahead. Please, Nafisa, 
go ahead your hand is up is jemima ready you can go ahead too so please yes. sister, say something like chemical pregnancy chemical Hello. pregnancy and your uh, out okay because of the serious crisis now like there was a problem i did pregnancy test for a client and it was positive mm -hmm. getting to about two three months the woman tested negative again so a colleague told me that there's a diagnosis called chemical pregnancy i don't know how okay for, so for that person how do you manage how do you continuously manage it did you take a scan because there are certain we mentioned that there are certain conditions that at all and there was no ectopic and uh, the scan shows no no fibroids no hydatidiform no nothing mm. who did that pregnancy test for her was it herself or she came for her i didn't i didn't and it, the test shows positive hello the test showed positive yes with the uh, uh -huh. history so we confirmed okay. with a an ultrasound scan and so there was no size okay did, per your history per your history did she ever tell you that she miscarried that she had well, let me not say miscarried she bled at any point no after a family planning for maybe she stopped for two months and she tested positive like that she stopped the family planning yes the family Some planning family. is five yes which family planning method was that depot okay so she stopped for, for two months yes then and she, she came in sales positive yes and then the scan revealed there was no pregnancy there was no hypothetical form no no ectopic yes, everything was normal if it's ectopic pregnancy it can also show hcg will be present in the urine okay or maybe the the client didn't give you the full history mm. mm -hmm. okay mm. so that's no, awesome. mostly take your 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 history very well as you probe you know that you you they begin to tell you things mm. hello sister Hello. Yes, please go ahead. I'm listening. Please, please pertain uh, to the question you. my colleague just asked. Mm -hmm. You know, there are times we can get false positive. Yes. Because so that's, why I I can... the, that's why I asked her if she did it herself. Because if you are a care provider and you do the pregnancy, you do a pregnancy test yourself and it's false positive, you know. And then maybe yes. you can tell the woman that let's follow up after some time. Do you understand me? Yes, please. Uh, at the times the, test, the at times the test kit might also be faulty. It's not all of them that are accurate. Exactly. Okay. And so that can give you a false positive uh, result. Yes. So and please. also, if she's in family planning, you know there are some that alters the hormonal changes in our system. So if the person stops, I think that can also produce a false positive result for her to think that she is pregnant. Mm -hmm. So if, if you go for the scan and it has confirmed that, no, there is no pregnancy, then you can give her some time, maybe, maybe two weeks or a month mm -hmm. for her to repeat the scan. If she repeats it and there is no pregnancy, then you can confirm that with her. That's Thank very, you very much. That's very true. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Hello, madam. Hello, Hello sister. sister. Hello, madam. Be sure to be able to notice which one is false positive and know how to manage it afterwards. Okay, thank you so much. Hello, madam. Yes. Hello. Jemima, go ahead. Hello, madam. Madam, please, with the internal ballotment, when exactly is the right time to do it so that you can really feel the actual kick of the fetus? Please come again with your question. Please, I'm talking of the internal ballotment. Mm -hmm. I just want to know when is the right time for you to do it so that you can actually feel the, the kick of the fetus. Okay, so um, the fetus are expected to move between 60 and 20 weeks. 
So okay. maximum, let's say 20 weeks, we should be able to do that. Okay. Hello. Yes, this is Belinda. Please, the one speaking can go ahead. If your line is breaking, if, if you could position yourself right for me. I can barely hear you. Can you position yourself well? Maybe there are another person can go ahead with their question. Hello, my Hello. name. Yes, Ohima, go ahead. Um, please, pertaining to what uh, yes. my sister was saying, uh, uh, by the force, uh, the UPT was positive, but the scan says negative. And then sometimes, uh, history taking some of the clients, there is a pressure on them in the house with wow. their husbands or their husband parents or something else. So sometimes they want to forge something that they will not have problem with the family. Exactly. So if you don't take care, sometimes they can forge something and then go home and tell the, parent, the family that I was mm -hmm. pregnant. Meanwhile, she was not pregnant. She's aware. So maybe she bled in between, but she will never tell you the That's truth. That's what I mentioned. That maybe she didn't yeah. tell you everything. And what what, yes. what you are talk, what you are talking about? I remember I had a, an issue like that before some years back. This woman came. She took an early scan, and you know, early scan they will tell you that you should come back in let's say two weeks to for us to confirm the fetal viability. So she took that scan report home. Then about three weeks time, she came She came with her husband, actually, and that she's coming for a natal book. And I asked her where her scan to confirm the pregnancy was. Then she brought out the same scan that she said that they that they should take it. They should take the scan in two weeks time. And I asked her, then it means we have to take the scan again, the two weeks one again, so that we confirm that um, there's pregnancy. Come and see this woman. Hey, I'm pregnant. Hey, come and see. Hey, I'm even chewing stick. And I... Uh, uh, blah blah the, a whole lot. Uh, and I got to know later on that she was under pressure. And the second visit, she came with the, the guy. So after all our back and forth, she came back alone to, to come and do the other scan. It came out the fact that she wasn't pregnant again. So that was when she opened that yeah. to me that this and this. So the second visit, she came with the guy. The guy purposely followed her to the clinic. You know, so we have some yeah. of these issues, yeah. So you should really probe further, probe, 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 probe. Yes. Tell you everything. Even even if you can give the uh, the patient to the doctor to also move on, leave it in that state so that you'll be safe. Because some yes. people they can give you trouble. Thank you're, you. You're, you're, thank you so much, Rahima. Thank you. Hello, sister. Yes. Um, Please let me let's go snappy with that. Okay. So that you can get the management and be done okay. for today. Please, I would like to know the difference between the Goodell sign and the Hegel sign. Because if I heard you right, you said um, the Goodell sign is the softening of the service, whilst the Hegel sign is also the softening of the Ismos. And then we know that the Ismos also forms part of the service. So I'm a bit confused. Come again with your question, please. Please, the difference between the Goodell sign and the Hegel sign. Mm -hmm. Good health sign. Because has to I do with... I heard you saying the good health sign is the softening of the service, and then I also heard that the Hegel sign is the softening of the ethmos, and then this ethmos also forms part of the service. That is the lower you try and segment. So is it the same or there yes. is no, no, a no, bit no. different? No. So ethmos forms the lower you try and segment. It's not the whole yeah. service. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's not the whole service. Yeah. Okay, so the Goodell sign is the softening of the whole service, while the Hegel sign is the softening of the yes. only the Ethmos. Yes, the Ethmos. Okay, okay, thank you. Hello, hello, sister. Yes. How many questions we have so far so that we can 
um, card and service. Okay, so, please. Go on. Go on. Who is on? Hannah. Better. Better. Please go on. Please, can you add a palpation of the fetus under the pos positive signs of the pregnancy? Or is part that? We can add. Is that we should add which one? Uh, <clears throat> palpation of the fetus under the positive sign of pregnancy. Yes, so not just palpation, hearing of the fetal heart rate, because the fetal heart rate, hearing of the fetal heart rate is, is, is fast. You may not hear fetal heart sounds. Sister, please, I think I'm still we have in the um, listening to the fetal heart rate. Right? Mm -hmm. huh. Sometimes you can palpate if there is a fibroid. You can palpate something. That may not be um, a feature. So we have the hearing of the fetal heart rate. So that one is more positive than just a palpation. Okay. Yes, please. Are we are we done with the questions? Hello, sister. Yes. Please, may I have to do with the internal ballot? Yes, and I do. That's when you, if you are able to, if you are able to touch the fetus. You, you can. The YouTube. So how come that is not under the positive sign? I am thinking that one should be under the positive sign. And the second question is with the pseudo sizes. You said it mostly occurs uh, among who are willing, who are willing mm -hmm. or who want to get pregnant. Yeah, is it only among those well, groups? Well, 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 I realize that Only in our process, there are some people who want to come. They are not in need of pregnancy. They come with a false as well. In your background, it's very, very noisy. Um, sister, please, I have a suggestion. Please, can we move on? Please, I have a suggestion. Go ahead. Um, please, when it comes to the hand raising, um, uh, the arrangement is mostly in order of when you raise your hand. But some people love to jump, having to, like getting two people talking at the same time. So please, I'm suggesting that those who come later, no, they should wait who have already raised their hand before they do. All right. Thank you. Well, yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Please, for instance, purposes, mm -hmm. for example, if you are asked to describe uh, pregnancy, and they didn't say that to anything. describe what? Signs and symptoms of pregnancy. Uh -huh. Describe or outline. Uh -huh. Outline the signs and symptoms of pregnancy. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, meaning, if, uh, assuming you, you, you have stated the positive signs, and maybe you realize the signs is finished and you add any of the presumptive sign or the probable sign, are you going to be marked correct? Um, usually, it will depend on the scenario. Okay. Uh, okay. Would, that will make it streamlined towards whether you are talking, yeah, they want positive signs or presumptive sign or whatever. But okay. if it's general, if it's general, then you can because all of the signs you've spoken about, they all have to do with pregnancy. Yes. And then you have other yeah, conditions. Uh huh. If oh, thank are, you. General, um, they are streamlined to you. You you give it as it is. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's quickly move on to how pregnancy is managed. Um, so once pregnancy has been diagnosed, we have a positive sign, 
We have the fact that we have a number of weeks the baby is present. We have a viable fetus. We need to manage this pregnancy as a midwife. Our work, our work as midwives is to properly manage this pregnancy um, for this woman to have you know, an event-free pregnancy and a safe delivery as well. So the management is done by antenatal care and it's being you know, beautified or another part of it has to be the focus antenatal care. So we look at all that. So basically, antenatal care is a health care that is given to a pregnant woman. You know, and mostly to be able to have... have Okay, so ensure high, uh, good maternal and neonatal health outcomes. It, it depends highly on a good antenatal care. You know, when there's um, a fetal demise or any maternal audit that we attend, most of the time, you see that at the end of the summary or the presentation, after it's been given, everything or most of the things will be pointing to the antenatal care section, mostly. I'm not saying that all the time, mostly, even though sometimes it has to do with the process of the delivery and, and, and all those things. And so when we go for maternal audits, in antenatal, then antenatal, then antenatal. So a very good positive, a very good maternal and neonatal health outcome will depend on a good antenatal care that has been rendered. And so for us and the antenatal you know, department, it's a very good work we are doing. Please let's do more and then ensure that our pregnant women are well Paid for. Okay. So at the end of the day, what do you want we have to achieve with all these antenatal care services? We want to promote and maintain the physical, the mental, and the social health of the mother and the baby. We do so by provide, I'll be speaking faster, and so but then I'll give you the slides because these are very simple ones. I just want to explain and you know just try to explain them as and when. Okay, so the first objective is that I want to promote and maintain the physical, the mental, that's holistic care of the mother and the baby. We do so by providing education to the pregnant woman on a range of topics. That's where we have nutrition, we have rest and sleep, we have personal hygiene, family planning, a range of them will come to all those ones. And then the next objective is that we want to detect and treat high-risk conditions that arise during pregnancy, whether it's medical, surgical, or surgery. So as we take history, during antenatal care, we take history. Per the history taking, we're able to detect, okay, this woman has a um, um, family history of hypertension. You mark her. She has a family history of you know, um, diabetes. You mark her. She herself has a previous history of diabetes in pregnancy. She's a high risk, so you take notice of all this. That's one objective of antenatal care and also to ensure the delivery of a full-term healthy baby with minimal stress, such that as and when the woman comes to antenatal, we take scans, we do labs, we check HV, we make sure that the baby um, the baby and the mother are in their optimum health. And if everything goes on well, we are expecting you know, a full, um, an event-free delivery. And everything goes well at the antenatal section, and everything goes well at the... Um, what do you call it, the labor award, we expect to have a healthy baby at the end of the day. And also, we want to help prepare the mother to breastfeed. No for no for as we always say at the antenatal section. It's one of our prime educational you know, topics that want to help them. Some women, I mean, we can all attest, after delivery, you want, want to give their babies to them and they are like, I'm afraid, I'm scared, and this and that. It shows that they were not well prepared for at the antenatal section, you know, and so um, it's one of the objectives. Another thing is I want to ensure safe delivery and postpartum health. Once we educate them, we let them know what will happen to them after delivery, what they are expected to see about their bodies. We, make, we ensure that everything is safe, what they are expected to, to go through at the delivery. Let them know that it's painful. Let them, let, don't let us say, oh, it will be just a mild pain, no, let them know it will be very painful. So here at um, my facility, we have videos to let them know this is what you go through, even as much as possible. If we, we can show them videos 
of the birth process itself, how they are, they are going to open their thing to let the baby come out. Let them let them know it psychs them about 80%. It takes away about 80% of the fear. And when they are when they go to deliver, they know what um they are going to expect. And then also to promote quality care. Um, antenatal care services needs to be organized in such a manner to provide comprehensive and individualized care. And that's what will lead us to the focused antenatal care. So it's also an objective of um, antenatal care, care as a whole. So the priority areas that we mostly focus on during antenatal care services, they are nutritional you know, status. We know how um, pregnancy takes a toll on the nutrition of these mothers. Sometimes you don't know what to eat. And sometimes we have a culture, you know, telling them to avoid a range of foods, which are not entirely true. And they are the things that could even help them, you know, have a quality nutrition. They tend to do away with those ones and do, you know, non-nutritional non stuff. So per our education, we need to, you know, um, emphasize on their nutrition. Maternal and fetal assessment, as they come, we palpate, we hear fetal heart rate, we, we assure them that their babies are doing well. We check their vital signs, we check their BP, we know that they are within the normal range. We know that we are okay. Preventive measures, we take, um, uh, what do you call this thing? Tetanus. Now, because of the intervention, of tetanus vaccine, we don't usually hear about um, widespread of tetanus, you know, it's because of the preventive measures that um, we do mostly at the antenatal care section. Intervention for common physiological symptoms, the things that uh, the new symptoms they would, you know, experience as, um, as pregnant women, the interventions we do for them, we can't. She, her, she has pedal edema. Her BP is fine. Her uh, urine, there's no protein whatsoever. Everything is fine. You intervene. How do you educate her? Let her know they are, they are quite normal, but then you continue to monitor. You know, so these are the interventions that some of the interventions we do for them. They are all priority areas. Health system intervention to improve the utilization and quality of antenatal care system. I have friends in the um, northern part of Ghana, not even in the northern part, old, old Volta region. They have to go from house to house. The institution supports them that they should go from um, um, they should go from house to house to render antenatal care services or postnatal care services to um, pregnant women and their babies. So the health system intervention, they are all priority areas that we need to look at. So how do we retain money um, our pregnancy? We have a number of visits that we are supposed to you know, observe. Not just the number of visits, but the contacts. WHO likes to put it as number of contacts. They like to put it as the number of contacts rather than the number of visits. So the number of visits made by a client is seen depending on her condition. And so you have um, a 32-week gravida, two para one woman. She presents to the clinic with a BP of about 136.85. 136.85. You recheck everything. is still within that normal range. You don't ask her to go and come in four weeks time. If possible, let her do a BP profile in the next three days, maximum one week. Let her present or report to you at the clinic. Let her um, report back to you at the clinic. And so, depending on not just high BP, those with you know questionable you know, um, uh, conditions, diabetes in pregnancy, malnutrition, low HB. You know, you don't schedule them as and when, but depending on their condition. For uncomplicated pregnancy, at least eight antenatal visits. You know, it used to be four. 
but now WHO has updated and now you need to make eight contacts, eight contacts, where the first contact has to be around 12 weeks. And then the next visit being around 20 weeks, where we take um the anomaly scan, it's purposely so that you take anomaly scan to detect abnormalities and treat. Then they can be seen as at 26 weeks, then at 30 weeks, 34 weeks, 36, 8, 38, and then at 40 weeks gestation. So this new you know, model, which has moved from the four to eight, it focuses on the action, the contacts, as I spoke about earlier, between the pregnant woman and the healthcare provider, not just about the number. In the order four, so you've come, you've come one, two, three, four, you are okay, you've satisfied the requirements. No, this time, there is not just about the number, it's about the contact. Say that if the person come at 20 weeks, and before the twenty sixth, the twenty sixth week that she will visit you, you should still or could still be in contact with the pregnant woman via phone, via um, physical visit, whatsoever. Yes. So during the first visit, what do you do? You take your history. Very very important aspect of it. There's a whole component task on taking past obstetric history, and um. I don't know how we'll do it on this Zoom platform, but I'll maybe we'll discuss, I'll discuss with Prof. to see how best we can go about this practical aspect. So it's part of it. You take the personal history, her name, her husband's name, where she stayed, um, her occupation, whether she's married or not, her house address, those bio data, her, um, any other contact person to fall on in case of, you know, the last time somebody came to the clinic, her BP was, um, do I remember, 160 something over 110, or it was more than 110. The moment we told this woman, uh, I think she knew about the fact that she had high BP. It was a second visit or so. So they told her, oh, we want to check again. This woman just got up and was going. So I was in the room. Um, one lady came to call me that, the woman is going away, she's running away. So I quickly went out. I went downstairs. I went to chase. And I said, Madam, why? Oh, that's um uh, they say her BP is high, um, blah blah. And I said, Oh, you come, we are in the hospital, we'll take care of you. Apparently, she knows her BP is high and she thinks she may be admitted. She didn't want it. We spoke and spoke and spoke. Once the OPD, some people came to talk. This woman said no, she was going to meet her doctor, her, her husband. That her husband was outside the hospital. Her husband, and I said, "Oh, you give me your the husband's your husband's number. I'll call him. I'll call him." And that no, the husband didn't even go to work or come out with his phone. So she herself is going to she will come back. And then I made one lady follow her to the OPD. She came back and she told me that this woman just fled. We had her book. We called her husband. Can you imagine the husband? <laughs> the husband was shocked at what the woman had done. And I can imagine what you know would go on in their house. But as midwives, we have done our part. We went ahead to call, you know, the 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 husband, and then so they are aware of all that is happening. Since then, this woman has not been to the facility. So if we are here one day and this woman comes in with fits or with any other complication, we as midwives, we have done our part because this time it was not just among ourselves as midwives that we saw her and she went. We involved the husband. So I'm well, that's I'm saying I'm talking about the personal history. Take all these personal histories. The husband's number, any other contacts person's number. Take their past obstetric history, ask them about any um pregnancy, the number of pregnancies they've had, whether they've had any spontaneous abortions, whether there's there's ever been any induced abortions. So usually I tell people when you are taking history, don't ask them, madam. Have you ever connected the abortion? She will never open up. So you ask her how many pregnancies, um, how many pregnancies. In tree is nicer, but some people said not all of you understand tree. You say it in a nice way. Please, um, have you ever gotten pregnant before? Oh, yes. Um, how many pregnancies, how many of them, you know, got spoiled? I, the English is not nice, but you let me say it in a way. How many pregnancies, you know, um miscarried do you have you ever had any miscarriage or have you ever you know terminated any pregnancy in a nice way they will open up but if you ask blunt like that 
they will tell you no. So let them know the importance as well that, oh, we are not asking this for anything. But sometimes if there's any intervention we have to do for you, we will fall on this information you have given us. And so please confide in us and give us and tell us the truth. Once somebody came and she was like, no, we'll not let you write this in the book. In that case, what would you do? Because she had induced a, in some number of induced abortions. But she said her partner was so inquisitive. You go and look inside the book. So you, as a healthcare provider, I'm throwing this to you. What, what will you do if you were if you are the one handling such a case? Yes, anybody, quickly, then we'll move on. We have some few minutes. Anybody? You are taking past obstetric history. Of course, you have to document in the book. This woman tells you, she, she opens up, yes, that she has a number of um, um, abortions, done, but she doesn't want you to document in her book. Yes, Mercy, please go ahead. Good afternoon, Mercy. I think when you take the answer, you have a feeling a number of abortions and induced or continuous induced in that case. For you not to take the case for the husband to see. Mm -hmm. You see, number of pregnancy you write. Mm -hmm. We have number of pregnancy and uh, uh, the, where the parity is. You see, when there is any abortion, when you write the parity number, you, you normally write plus. Or yes. it is there you indicate. So when you indicate that part without taking the abortion side, every midwife will know from the parity when you indicate that, but the husband wouldn't know. But with the health person, you do understand. Okay, okay, I understand. Is there any other? The, those with their hands up. Another person. Hello? Yes, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mostly. That is the same thing we also do. Instead of writing a uh, number of pregnancies you write, number of abortions you write, mm -hmm. you leave it like the previous three, the way we were writing. Okay. Maybe gravida four mm -hmm. para two plus two. Okay. Okay. Uh, para two plus one. So that it will be that previous uh, abortion. Abortions. Okay. So, uh -huh. I but guess. I had some uh, contribution to make uh, the number of... Uh, to ask number of pregnancies. You know, most of the times when you talk, just mention abortion, they don't want to count it. Yes, yes. So mostly, yes. what I do is that I ask, please, madam, how many children do you have? Mm -hmm. They will mention mm -hmm. three. Please, have you had pregnancy that have spoiled before? Mm -hmm. They will say yes. How many? Then they'll count. Then you now add it to the pregnancy. Yes. Before you now go further to ask the pregnancy that's poor, did this poor by itself or you took oh, something yeah. or you did something? Yeah. Yeah. Then they will not tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Then you now ask of those that died, you yeah. delivered, delivered by herself, and then maybe they died later on. Okay. Then okay. you now come and do your calculation and be able to write the gravida and then the parity there. But if you just mention anything abortion there, they feel like they see it to be something else. They yeah. might not even count it for you. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so You're much. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. So that's with the past of surgery. You also take your medical history. Um, our antenatal book is even guided now. We have the various medical conditions that you ask the woman. You know, then you just ask and take as appropriate as, appropriate as possible. Where there's any medical condition, it's advised that you use a red pen to mark it so that if it's not you, she comes to the clinic, she doesn't meet you, she meets any other person. Upon seeing a red outline, the person's attention will be drawn, you know, to 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 it. Um, let me give you an, another scenario as well. Once we had a case, she was actually referred um from one um, one of the regions who wanted to give birth in my facility. So she came to continue here. Apparently. When she came in the antenatal book, her med her own medical history, she had she had circled, they had circled hypertension in red. Then we continued with the care until she delivered. So she came in at 39 plus something weeks with the fact that she was not feeling the fetal heart rate. 
we check the fetal heart rate it was it was absent we compared with the scan and the scan you know further confirmed that there was no fetal heart rate and that the baby had died so upon that's where we came to take the you know the full history or let me say the proper history and then that's where the woman was also kind of opening up to let us know that eh that this is what you think you have had way before she even got pregnant and that she was taking um lysinopril and what was this forgotten the other drug but there are some of the anti that are sometimes indicated in pregnancy we lost that baby because of you know the anti-hypertensive she was taking <laughs> Okay, so if we had taken the history well, the one preparing for this is all of five. I've muted everybody, but they keep muting themselves or muting. We find it difficult to hear your voice. Everybody is muted, but when I finish, then you will mute again. Okay, so what I'm saying is that um, the history was not well taken. This woman kept taking her um, lysinopril and, oh, I've forgotten this antihypertensive, but it's contraindicated in pregnancy. And that was the cause of the fetal death. This is somebody who had gone up to um, 39 plus, almost almost 40. She's terminal, but we lost the baby. So proper, you know, history taking will do us the magic of ensuring maternal and um, positive maternal and neonatal outcomes. You take your surgical history as well. That's where you ask about um, previous you know, surgeries that have been taken for her or not. Rita. Yes, Rita, please go ahead. Rita, about the history taking. Mm -hmm. My colleague was saying that um, you shouldn't be writing, he suggests that you shouldn't be writing the number of abortions in that column and therefore for confidentiality sake. But for me, I think that whatever we are doing for the patient is not to be compromised. Because if even if you don't write it there, how would you know if the person like, has had previous spontaneous, spontaneous abortions and needs to be Okay, Even in the new ANC book, I think that they have columns to write the number of abortions, when and how they occurred there. And I think if you do it that way, it helps us because if you try to compromise with the client as about privacy and all those things, you get a client who is gravida four para three and will come and say that she's gravida one para four. And at the end of the day, when she delivers, you end up managing PPH. And you wouldn't understand. So that is what I suggest. Oh, yes, Rita. Yes, yeah, so What what we were talking about was the scenario I made that somebody comes to the clinic. She tells you she opens up to you actually that she has this number of abortions done, but then, um, she doesn't want you to write it in her book. You know, it was out of that that um your colleagues made a suggestion that okay, what well, this is what you do. You notice it as part of the pregnancy, but as part of the parity, you write plus, you know, let's say gravida five para two, then plus, um, that would be plus, plus one. So any other person who looks into the book will query that plus one. What was that plus one? Was it this or that? So we are not saying that you shouldn't write at all, but if you meet such a case, that is when they suggested that you can do that. And I think, um, the, what the clients want, we can do it for them. But if at the end of the day, go and write it this way, 
especially for um, HIV positive mothers. We have we have some of them, they leave their books with us that they can't take their books home because their their partners are going to look into the books. We do it for them just to ensure, you know, because now we are not the pregnant women are not only our clients, but they have family as well, you know. Uh -huh. So it was just about that 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 scenario I made. Okay, so patients have something else to say too. Sister, please, I have a suggestion mm -hmm. concerning the midwife's friend. I had a case in the labor world whereby the woman cancelled it. So I would suggest that maybe we should find a different way of writing it. And we, the midwife, we should also be careful how we explain certain Thanks. terms to our friends or family members because if we explain them to them sometimes they know what you've written in their book yeah. so at the yeah. end of the day they cancel it and then when they come into the world and you the midwife attending to them they are not careful mm. you might end up being at risk, at risk. thank that, you thank you so much thank you so much yes please mother have a question yes please Please, uh, in pregnancy, do you wait for the BP to be high before you now say the preg the woman has hypertension? No. Uh huh. No. Because what I know is that I'm not too sure if the systolic increase by thirty and the diastolic by fifteen, you should probe uh, pH. Mm -hmm. Because in my case, like this, when I was pregnant, the highest BP I had was a one thirty. Mm hmm. Yeah, but I, I, I even dilated before 28 weeks. So I don't know. Normally, my BP is not up to 100. But when uh -huh. I was pregnant, it went up to 130. That was the highest I had. Okay, that's but what I had. So when the diastolic was? The diastolic went to a 95. Okay, yes. Yeah, so the scenario I made earlier, I said a woman comes and she's 130. Let's use yours. 130, 90 something or 130, 80 something. You should start querying there and then you can diagnose PIH. But yeah, um, you can do you can let her do a BP profile. She goes home, takes her BP in the mornings and the evenings for minimum three days, maximum one week. She reports to you. So when she comes, she brings you that report. You can see the trend. Whether if, if it's within the 130s, 90s, or in one case, you get 140, 90. Then you take other investigation. That's where you begin to do the RFT, the LFTs. Then maybe you put on you they refer them to the doctors, they put them on low dose aspirin, calcium, something like that to manage, you know, at that level. But if they do the RFT, the LFTs, and they begin to say